Hello and welcome to this episode of Worldwise on Blogging Heads TV. Uh, my name is Joshua Keating. I'm an associate editor at Foreign Policy Magazine and I'm uh, here in uh, Washington, D.C. Now I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, our guest, Diego Aria. Uh, Diego, would you like to introduce yourself? Well, thank you so much. I'm Diego Aria, uh, I'm a Venezuelan. I was, uh, my, latest, my latest post was ambassador to Venezuela to the United Nations. And uh, space afterwards, I was uh, Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations. And before, I've been Governor of Caracas, but my most recent participation in Venezuelan politics was uh, uh, as a presidential candidate uh, in the opposition primaries in last October. Thank you, Josh. Great. So just a few days ago here in Washington, we, we inaugurated a uh, Barack Obama for his second term, but uh, what we're going to be talking about today is an inauguration that, that didn't happen. Uh, on January 11th, uh, Hugo Chavez was due to be sworn in as president, but uh, he's currently in Cuba being uh, treated for cancer, has not been seen in, uh, in public since early December, and wasn't able to be at his own swearing in. So I guess my first question to you, uh, Diego, as you know, just as an observer of Venezuelan politics, is is who is running Venezuela right now? Uh, who, who's in charge in Caracas? You know, Josh, uh, magic realism is not bad in Latin America. We have a president that spent, uh, or a former president actually, who spent last year 200 days in a hospital in Havana suffering cancer. He has been away 42 days since he won the last election, and he was not able to be inaugurated uh, on January. Nevertheless, his regime did something unusual. They gathered up about 10,000 people in the streets and they swore them in, saying Chavez es la gente, es el pueblo, Chavez is the people. So they, instead of swearing in Chavez as president, they, they actually inaugurated the people, swore in the people. So today, actually, we are in a de facto government. A man who used to be the vice president that in, our, in our system is designated by the president is running the country, even though his, his job expired in January 10th. So we have a former president who was re-elected, but has not been in Venezuela since he won the elections. Hmm. So, you know, obviously, uh, as we saw from the demonstrations on the 11th, there's still, you know, uh, Chavez's supporters are still willing to, to come out. We saw several foreign heads of state show up, but you know, without without the man himself being in the country, without uh, you know, with Chavismo, without Chavez, I mean, how long can this last? Uh, how long before the sort of supporters of the Bolivarian Revolution, you know, start to start to demand that uh, that he show himself or or some changes be made? You know, that's uh, we uh, know is a uh, at least uh, the helicopters flying over the city because the Chavistas are marching in the city. Uh, and the armed forces that are at the service of Mr. Chavez are uh, going along with them. Well, the issue is uh, that uh, the president may never come back. He's in Havana, Cuba. And uh, all the news that we hear, he might come back. No one is saying whether he will come back alive or dead. And uh, Venezuela is uh, in absolutely, uh, like I said before, a de facto regime. And uh, something that I give here, because uh, all the developments on the ground are, are crawling into the system. For example, the armed forces do not have uh, a, a commander in chief. Uh, all the uh, ministers that have kept their post actually are illegally holding the post. For how long can we withstand that? Uh, it's been easy up to now for the regime because they control the armed forces. And this is a militarized government where 12 of our 23 uh, governors are military and 2,000 of the most important uh, people from the government are also uh, military officers. So they are actually sitting on top of the violence. Hmm. So, you know, generally when, uh, when regimes fall, even in a popular revolution, the turning points usually when when their sort of key supporters abandon them, and, and when, in particular, when the armed forces abandon them. So, you know, what, what are we seeing from uh, from the military in Venezuela? Do they seem like they're they're willing to stick it out, or are there sort of people moving behind the scenes, uh, you know, vying for position, uh, trying to 
trying to push this this Vice President Maduro out? You know, the the coopsters in Venezuela are all in the government, beginning with Chavez, mm -hmm. who's the most important coopster uh, in Venezuela. Uh, most of his ministers participated with him in the 1992 coup attempt against President Perez. So they are the experts. We are in a democratic uh, avenue, uh, trying to mitigate the damage done to our, our democracy, even though we're about to lose our liberties. Uh, the army is under the control of the Cuban intelligence officer, intelligence officer, people that may watch blogging heads, will be curious to, to understand how, how come a country is bigger, six times bigger than Cuba, 10 or 20 times richer than Cuba, is under the Cuban uh, tutelage, uh, under the Cuban control. This is a fact. Uh, last week, the three most important members of this government, Mr. Maduro who was a former vice president, the president of the general of the National Assembly, and the minister of mines, Venezuela Oil Company. They went to Havana to meet not with Chavez. They went to Havana to meet with Raúl Castro, because Castro is the one who gives instructions to the Venezuelan government. So, uh, and who controls the armed forces of Venezuela? The Cubans. They have uh, officers that control. Uh, they have all the intelligence apparatus of the armed forces. Is, are controlled by the Cuban. So Venezuela, Venezuela today, unfortunately, has become a Cuban colony that had lost completely its sovereignty. So I think this is an idea that, that's a little hard for a lot of people outside the country to understand. I mean, from, from what we hear, it was in many ways Venezuela that, that rescued uh, Cuba by providing uh, uh, you know, uh, oil at a discount. You know, we saw there's a story today that um, Cuba has opened up this broadband cable, the, the Alba cable that was built by, uh, partially by Venezuela. I mean, it, it seems from the outside like that uh, uh, Cuba is the one that's been benefiting most from this partnership. But what you're saying is that, that uh, Cuba actually has the upper hand in this relationship? You know, uh, Josh, uh, Venezuela, Chavez, it's actually I'm not the Venezuelans. I've given Cuba in the last uh, 10 years more than $10 billion. We provide them 100,000 barrels of oil a day, out of which Cuba resells on the international market 20 or 30,000 barrels a day. There are so many uh, on the ground, I would say, contracts signed by Venezuela and Cuba, the, uh, which magnitude we still do not know, but we're financing houses, we're financing roads, we're financing ports, we're financing refinery, refineries in Cuba and uh, buying uh, foodstuff, buying medicines and uh, renting people. You know, Cubans are on the basis of renting doctors and sports trainers. Uh, we have 60,000 Cubans in Venezuela according to the government. It means we may have more, out of which five or 6,000 of them are intelligence officers, military officers actually that are here to make sure that there is control on the armed forces, that is control on the civilian sector, and to be here in case that there is something, on an, an event that may need a military uh, support from the Cubans. It is a very sad and terrible story, but this is the way that we are living today in Venezuela. Hmm. So tell me a little bit about what we know about Nicolas Maduro. Um, this is, I, I know, from what I've read, he draws a lot of his influence from his uh, Cuban connections, his uh, relationship with the Castro brothers. Um, uh, but, you know, uh, what do we know about his worldview? And, and if the, is he just a pure, loyal Chavista who will keep everything uh, as it was? Or do you think there's sort of potential for him to, uh, to shake things up, you know, if and when uh, his, his position ever gets a little more permanent? You know, Maduro is made up completely by Chavez. It's, uh, Maduro would not have any role were it not for Chavez. Maduro spent some time in Cuba, being trained by the Cubans before uh, he became, uh, Chavez had made of him president of the National Assembly at one time and foreign minister for the last six years. He has a, a he was a, a sort of a labor leader in the uh, transportation uh, system of Caracas. That's where he emerged. But he is uh, an apparatchik in the sense completely, his loyalty is exactly with Charles. Amazingly, he, in these days, 
he's trying to compete with Chavez in a way that is becoming more radical and more vocal and, uh, and more scandalous in his remarks about the Venezuelan people, about the Venezuelan opposition, because he wants to prove that he's as tough or tougher than Chavez to the followers of another man who also aspires on the Chavez ranks, who is the president of the National Assembly, a former lieutenant, who is really a major threat to a, a, any political system, as he had proven in the past when he participated with Chavez in the 1992 coup. Maduro is a man that's been trained by the Cubans, is uh, trusted by the Cubans, and was selected by the Cubans together with Charles. This is a reality. Hmm. But, um, so, you know, in terms of uh, U.S. foreign policy, uh, do, do you foresee any changes under Maduro? From what I read, there was a, a conversation between him and uh, uh, Roberta Jackson at the State Department in November. Uh, you know, there's, there's some conflict about what exactly they talked about, but do you think, uh, you know, if, if Chavez either died or, or it became clear that he was unable to continue, do you think there would be any potential for the relationship to, to become more normalized between the U.S. and Venezuela? Um, or, and and would, would you like to see any change in, in that relationship? You know, where Chavez, uh, where Chavez died, he, there would be an election. And then, of course, Maduro first would have to win the elections. But, I mean, imagine that, that uh, black scenario where he would win the election. Uh, he would not have the political uh, power to do something like to restart a diplomatic, full diplomatic relation with the United States. He would not be able to withstand the attacks that he would come from his own party that may consider him, you know, as a softy. So, were he to become president, uh, uh, there would not be a change at all in that with respect to, to uh, a closer relationship or normalization of a relationship with the United States, maybe down the road, but I, I hardly believe that that would be the case. Mm. But he does seem a bit less, uh, well, I guess we haven't heard much from him yet, but it, but in terms of rhetoric, he seems far less strident than Hugo Chavez. It's hard to, from, it's hard to imagine Maduro getting up in front of the UN, you know, saying he smells sulfur when the last U.S. president was there, or, you know, going on TV every week trying to bait Washington. Uh, he seems to, you know, at least have a different kind of rhetorical style than, than Chavez did. Is that right? Well, you're also right. You know, Chavez is a unique character. He is indeed a buffoon, but uh, people underestimate him for that. He's a very dangerous and smart buffoon. Uh, Maduro, he will try to do a poor, he's already a poor and bad imitation of Chavez, who is quite a character. I, I believe that he, uh, a government under Maduro will, will self-implode. I don't think we'll have the capacity mm. to rule Venezuela because the, the, uh, the number of promises and commitments made by Chavez to the people would be impossible uh, to satisfy. And Chavez was able to satisfy them in a way because of his uh, relationship with the people, which is actually uh, extraordinary, uh, especially to the lower sectors or lower income people in the country. Maduro doesn't have that touch. Maduro doesn't have the charisma. And Maduro doesn't have that he's not as smart enough as Chavez is uh, to really manage a country that uh, whose resources, even though are immense, the uh, the expenditures are even more immense, even. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, I, I want to get back a little bit to this sort of question of the U.S. Venezuelan relationship. I think that's probably interesting to a lot of people here. I mean, during the sort of early years of the Bush administration, we saw a lot of kind of. Uh, barbs being traded back and forth between Washington and Caracas. It seemed like in the in the second Bush term, and especially in the Obama years, there's been a kind of you know almost ignore Chavez and maybe he'll go away attitude that um, uh, you know, that that uh, there's been sort of less of a focus on Venezuela in U.S. policy. I'm wondering if that's the impression you got, and if you think that's helpful, or if you would like to see. Um, the U.S. administration speaking out more forcefully about what's going on in Venezuela. Do you think there's a more uh, active role they could be playing in, in what's going on there from, from your perspective? You know, I sympathize. I always I sympathize many times with the U.S. attitude toward Latin America in general. When the U.S. gets too involved, it's being immediately criticized 
for trying to intervene in our affairs. When the United States is distant from our affairs, it's criticized as being insensitive. Uh, when, uh, when there is a cause in Latin America of our interest, and the Americans, uh, the U.S., give an opinion, we immediately say, this is going to alter and deform our situation. So the U.S. is really uh, tight and uh, limited by many of these uh, uh, restrictions to play a more active role. But there is one that the United States has refused to play. For example, in the case of Venezuela, they know exactly and very well the kind of connections that many of the Chavez uh, generals and top officials have with narco traffic, drug trafficking, uh, money laundering, uh, arms cargo, arms uh, traffic. In a way, they have this. The, the U.S. Treasury Department have uh, included into the Kingpin list six or seven Venezuelan generals and one admiral and one former mayor of Caracas. They have in, in, in the United States uh, a former member of the Supreme Court of Justice called Aponte Aponte, that the Drug Enforcer Enforcement Administration took him over to the United States as a protected witness. This information that the United States has, really, on the links of this government with the worst uh, crime and uh, rape and terrorists and narco-traffic groups of Latin America, were it to be known by the Venezuelans, it would do great damage uh, to the, this image that the Chavez regime has of getting worried, a worry on social issues that are for the people. It will reveal that this is the most corrupt government and regime we ever had in our Venezuelan history. But the U.S., like other major powers, refuse to provide to share information until they feel that the real concerns and interests are at stake. This is a pity because this is a role that could be extremely helpful to us. And also another role that would be helpful is to try, you know, they, and, in a way the United States has been helpful, is uh, trying to assist NGOs, organizations that strive for democracy. But the Chavez regime immediately calls them, you know, puppets of imperialism. And uh, the, the, this chance of uh, imperialism in Venezuela has become a sort of a mantra. Uh, you hear the people in the streets saying, no, we have to protect ourselves from the imperialists. And I always ask them, are you speaking of the Chinese? Or are you speaking of the Americans? You know, uh, the term imperialism has been, as you know, changed completely by, by events in the world. But for Venezuelans, this means the United States. To that effect, I mean, I, I think that a lot, one concern people have here, and this has come up in, in other countries, in Russia and Iran, is that if the U.S. is too outspoken in supporting uh, opposition groups, that'll undermine them, that'll allow the government to say, oh, you know, this, this uh, opposition group is just a sort of puppet of, of U.S. imperialism. Um, you know, you, you're not really concerned about that, that, uh, that uh, you know, a more active U.S. role would, would actually be counterproductive for, for uh, Venezuelan opposition groups? Yes, you know, even though, you know, there are times when one say, why don't we get uh, the support, you know, of a powerful government, for example, and helping us in the Organization of American States or at the United Nations. Uh, but uh, I fully understand the implication of such help. But, for example, uh, the only income that we have in foreign exchange today comes from the United States. Venezuela mm -hmm. has reduced its sales of oil to America from one million and a half to eight to nine hundred thousand barrels for oil. That means about fifty uh, today price is about fifty five billion dollars a year. Uh, because Venezuela Chavez has changed our structure of, of exports. Now we're we are giving to China about half a million barrels a day at a lower price, and it takes 45 days to transport our oil to China at a high transport cost. But the, the only money comes from the United States. Imagine an scenario, which I'm not suggesting, but imagine. Because the Venezuela speaks so badly of the United States. It's only time saying that the empire is going to invade us, that the empire is behind any action of Venezuela. If the weather changes, it is empire. If a child is cancer, uh, and uh, Lula's cancer in Brazil, people in Venezuela said that there was a conspiracy by the CIA to uh, inject uh, 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 drugs that will create cancer into the bodies of President Lula, Kirchner, and right. Chavez. Now, if that's the case, and that they hate the Americans, and that they cooperate with drug, uh, drug traffickers, 
that they cooperate with terrorists. Well, don't buy the oil from Venezuela. I mean, if they don't buy the oil from Venezuela, even though our oil is, is a fungible commodity, Venezuela will be in a very serious situation because you will not have foreign exchange. Hmm. So, so, yeah, yeah that, that, that brings me to another that question. Would be, that, 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 Josh, that oh. would be a wake-up call, a real wake-up call. Hmm. Right. So I want to talk a little bit about Chavez's role as a leader of the Latin American left. Um, you know, our, our mutual friend, uh, Moises Naim, the former uh, editor of foreign policy, had a great piece a few years ago where he sort of broke the leftist governments down into the, the axis, of, axis of Hugo and the axis of Lula, that there was this sort of new generation of leftist leaders uh, going up that, that sort of followed uh, more of the Brazilian model. Um, you, you know, I, I think in recent years we've seen more of the leftist governments that have come into power have, have sort of followed the Lula mold, whether it's, uh, or, or at least rhetorically, you know, Ollanta Humala in Peru, Muica um, in, in, in Uruguay, they, they all sort of say they're more, they're more Lula socialists than Hugo socialists. I'm curious, you know, if, um, you know, if, if Chavez were suddenly removed from the scene, I mean, is there... Is there anyone to take his place? Is that sort of stridently anti-American, uh, sort of old-style Latin American leftism? Is, uh, it, it, is is that the end of it? If 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 he's if he's no longer around to lead it? You know, I remember the issue that you had in foreign policy that it was called Hugo Boss. I remember that. Right. right. <laughs> Which I thought was, uh, and uh, uh, of course I read Moses all the time and I follow him as a close friend. The uh, the Chavez image, uh, no one in Latin America, or for that matter, probably in the world, has spent more than $100 billion cultivating his personal image like Chavez. We have a squander, given away, subsidized, uh, about 90 to $100 billion all over Latin America, in some African countries, even in the United States. You know, we've been subsidizing oil through Mr. Kennedy in Boston, uh, machinery to provide uh, subsidized fuel oil to poor neighborhoods in the Bronx. We used to provide uh, subsidies in London for the transportation system, even though we didn't have money in our own children's hospital. So the Chavez uh, image has been created at the expense of the Venezuelan people because they have, he has squandered all our resources to create his own image. That, of course, encouraged other, other leaders in Latin America like uh, Morales, like uh, uh, Ortega in Nicaragua, um, uh, the president of Ecuador, Correa. Uh, but oh, yeah. time comes for them immediately. They have a wake-up call when they realize that they don't have the unlimited resources that Mr. Chavez has, that has allowed him to run free and to break all kinds of rules and to buy uh, complicities uh, uh, all over Latin America. Most of the most important Latin American countries have been accomplices with Chavez. Brazil is the first one. Brazil has, has the largest is construction companies, have the largest uh, construction contracts in Venezuela without public bidding. Uh, so Venezuela has become a very special client for Brazil. The, I would say, you know, it's not the Lula model. Lula inherited the Fernando Enrique Cardoso's model, which actually he took on. And Lula, I think, uh, successfully uh, carry on that. Well, our friend Moises Naim once described Lula, he said, uh, uh, an economic giant and a moral midget. Uh, meaning, you know, that uh, next to Brazil's accomplishment, the economic field under Lula and Cardoso, his uh, political uh, vision have been tainted by the way he has been, uh, for example, been an accomplice of Chavez, saying that Chavez, mm -hmm. you know, the greatest president in the history of Venezuela, coming from a man like Lula who doesn't have an idea of Venezuelan history. So uh, there are no, 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 no one in Latin America that would have the resources of Venezuela to play their role. And in a way, Josh, what's happening, and it's not being realized properly, the Venezuelan monies have been used to promote Castroism, the Marxism in Latin America. Our money is being used to promote the Castro's revolution which they didn't have the resources in different countries in Latin America. You will find them everywhere, thanks to the Venezuelan patrimony. That's why the existence of the Chavez regime is of fundamental value not only to Cuba's economic survival, 
is uh, vital for many people uh, groups in Latin America. It's vital for the narco groups that operate in Venezuela. It's vital for the narco terrorism that has made Venezuela a haven of protection of this kind of, uh, of trade, of crime. So the, the Venezuela's, uh, uh, what is at stake in Venezuela is not only our own people, and many other people in the world that depends on Venezuelan subsidies or Venezuelan cooperation that Chavez has given away uh, in our detriment. Hmm. Would you like to see uh, Brazil sort of taking on more of a, a regional leadership role? Um, you know, it, it's been a question uh, as, as, you know, that they've risen economically, you know, are they going to sort of, uh, you know, act as, and, and, and as you said, with, with the U.S. taking sort of a less active role in Latin America, will they sort of step in to fill the breach? Um, you know, what, what, what kind of role do you see for a sort of uh, uh, Brazil as a regional power in South America? What would you like to see out of them? You know, I have, I had a very special opportunity to watch Brazil uh, in reality uh, because I was a member of the Security Council, non-permanent member. Actually, at one time I was the president of the Security Council of the United Nations. And I had Brazil, actually, we sat next to each other in the Security Council. And uh, Brazil uh, plays in a way like the old Portuguese empire. Uh, Brazil uh, in, uh, was playing like uh, they were outside of the region. They were bigger. Actually, Brazil itself is bigger than the whole uh, Latin American region. It's even bigger than the United States, uh, the, uh, the continental United States. And the issues, for example, Haiti, El Salvador, were not looked by them as uh, issues of interest. Angola, Mozambique, the former French uh, Portuguese colonies were. Uh, so uh, then you, you see, for example, we yes, have in Venezuela the situation which you asked me at the beginning of a government, a de facto government. This was a golden opportunity for Brazil that aspires to become a permanent member of the Security Council to play a leading role to make sure that the constitution of a country, a member of the, United, of the Organization of American States, as Venezuela, is protected. No, they, uh, they made some statements that did not play the role that a supposedly aspiring major uh, superpower, because that's what the members of the Security Council are, could be. Uh, I believe that the, the way Brazil's foreign policy is conducted today doesn't make it a transparent, and trust and trusting uh, partner of the region. I will be very concerned that, for example, that Brazil were to be elected the, uh, alone as a, uh, as a permanent member of the Security Council on behalf of Latin America. Uh, uh, for me, uh, that would be a, a serious uh, limitation. Brazil will tend to link its interests to other major powers and, and uh, actually would put in a second level the relationship and the interests of Latin America. Venezuela is very important for Brazil for obvious reasons, because we are probably one of the most important clients, but that's it. Hmm. So, um, you know, lo looking forward in Venezuela, I mean, do, you, do you think that, uh, I mean, how do, how, do you see, how do you see this ending? Do you think that there's a possibility for um, a kind of popular uprising there? Do you think this government will only fall if it's torn apart from within? Um, can the opposition actually actually win an election in Venezuela? Is that is that still possible? Um, you know, what, what's you know, as a sort of uh, long time observer and, and a long time participant in this, um, I'm curious what what you think the the end game is here. You know, I'm going to give you an answer probably like the doctors when you ask them, "What's my problem, doctor?" And they tell you, "You have a virus, <laughs> or you have an infection." You know, when you don't know exactly what's going on, a virus or infection is the answer. In Venezuela, the situation is extremely fluid. Uh, there are all, all the scenarios are possible. Uh, you cannot bar any. Uh, mm. You know, major social changes are never anticipated. No one knew that the Berlin Wall was going to fall until it fell. Uh, there was not one book written about it before it fell. Venezuela is similar. Uh, today, we are in a vacuum of power. Uh, vacuums tend to be filled, as you know. Uh, we have uh, internal fights uh, within the regime. We have the, the external participation of Cuba that is beginning to hurt uh, the national pride of many members of the armed forces. 
uh, they probably they do not express it publicly, but they don't find it, uh, uh, they find humiliating that they have to obey orders by Cuban generals or Cuban colonels, or that the Cubans are in control of our intelligence apparatus. In, you know, the Cubans are today in charge of making our passports and ID uh, identification cards. They mean in, in our registries. They have control of the properties of Venezuela. They know who owns the property, in which places. They, they have all the data and information that is reserved usually for a country. So it's, it's under their control. We'll, uh, you know, we had a presidential election in October. Uh, even though here the electoral arbiter is more the Ministry of Election of Mr. Chavez and the Supreme Court and it's, is at its service, the Attorney General is at its service, and the Armed Forces seems to be also under the service. For example, the Minister of Defense said a couple of weeks ago, said, the Armed Forces are Chavistas, anti-imperialist, uh, revolutionary, and socialist. Were it not to be enough, the President of the, the Supreme Court yesterday said, it's a label, said. The judicial power of Venezuela is today aligned with the revolutionary Bolivarian plans of Mr. Chavez to make this country, uh, 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 to make this revolution successful and independent from all from imperialism. So when you see that the armed forces, the judicial system, the national assembly is under the control of Chavez, and at the same time you have. 50% uh, of the population that is against, at least from an electoral point of view, is a, is a combination, is a cocktail that could have all, you know, all kinds of consequences. So far, the people live on the great the threat, the fear. Uh, they have about 100,000 militia that are spread around the country, armed, that uh, they have what they call colectivos, which are a group of paramilitary in the barrios that are being armed by the armed forces, armed by the regime. So we're surrounded by thugs, and this is not uh, a regular government. There are a lot of thugs here. It's, a, it's like a gang a ruling a country that used to be democratic, free, with problems, limitations, but free and democratic. Mm. The last election did seem to be, you know, it, it, it was at least a kind of very energetic showing by by the opposition. Um, you know, I, I, I'm curious to say, well, you know, what what. What do you think the uh, the Venezuelan opposition's uh, game plan should be going forward, and uh, you know how how should they contest these elections and and frame their appeal, and, and uh, you know what what's your sort of strategy for for combating the regime right now? You know, I was a, uh, a precandidate in the primaries to select, right, right. Uh, which, uh, as you know, I failed. Uh, but uh, I made some points, and you know, we are facing a transition. If we do not uh, recover the, the public powers, we'll never be able to govern. And the other members of the opposition said, no, you know, uh, people will change their attitudes once we win. Well, today, we are living exactly the nightmare that I suggested. I even wrote a book called uh, Venezuela, the Hour of Truth, which is now being sold a lot because, uh, unfortunately, many of the things that I anticipated are happening. Now, mm -hmm. uh, I held in that opportunity that we are not dealing with a regular government. And uh, that the issue, that what, what was at stake here was not uh, a campaign or a, a political marketing, uh, like a traditional campaign in a normal country, that we were facing a thuggish government that would do anything in its power to make it impossible for us to win because there were many other interests besides the, the Venezuelan regime, like I explained before. But the, the opposition chose to run a campaign that uh, was non-ideological, to offer a campaign of public works, you know, we'll build roads, we'll build homes, but uh, there was no, actually, they, they were similar in the social approaches. For example, Chavez, they call missions of social uh, works, they say, well, we'll make a legislation to make sure that this mission work better. So they, 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 they offer the Chavez, uh, in a way, Chavez public uh, program, but run with efficiency, uh, like if this was a management issue instead of an ideological issue. Venezuela mm -hmm. is today at the uh, risk of losing its liberty, the rights that still remain, but the leaders of the opposition continue to believe that what the Venezuelans need today is to fill potholes, to 
to build homes, and it is, it is true that we need all those things, but we need this to confront a regime that is taking away our liberties and has suspended our rule of law in Venezuela, and you cannot create a society without that. Well, it's not just potholes, though. I mean, there's, uh, what does it have, the uh, second or third highest murder rate in the world right now, and, uh, um, um, and you know, one of the world's, uh, uh, the country with the world's largest oil reserves is, is importing gasoline. I mean, there's sort of major uh, social problems to, uh, and, and economic issues to address, as, as well as the democracy issue, right? You know, we import the gasoline from the empire. From the imperialists, <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> imperialists sell it to the Chavez regime. You know, with pleasure. You know, it's business is business. But uh, for example, were it not for the United States, there will not be gas in many automobiles today in Venezuela. And uh, but still, you know, sometimes I wonder uh, whether a decision of that nature, which I suggested to you before, will be a real wake up uh, call for the Venezuelans. You know, the issue of security in Venezuela is the most dangerous capital. It's second or third country. Every weekend here, that 120, 140 people kill violently. You know, this is more than in Iraq or Afghanistan. Uh, you know, pretty soon we're going to be reached the Syrian uh, level. And, uh, and this is under a military regime. But, but now, why is this happening? There is uh, uh, impunity. Uh, the legal system allows many things to happen, the corruption, the police and military forces, who are, for example, the people who run or protect the most important drug dealers in Venezuela, are some members of the armed forces. The, the other ones are in the kingpin list of the United States. But, you know, uh, the United States and other countries continue talking to these people who are being indicted as the kingpin list uh, because uh, they are members of the Chavez government. And Venezuela is a country that imports a lot of a lot of goods of the United States and other uh, Latin American countries and provides jobs for the economy. So they look the other way. The Venezuelan the oil money has served is, is serving against our own interest because it's helping to keep the world blind to look the other way uh, and not to look at the plight of the Venezuelan people. It is, you know, a tri a, it's a tragic situation, Josh. Believe me. Yeah. Sadly, sadly, a pretty common one. Um, all right, I think we'll uh, probably uh, wrap it up there. But uh, thank you so much for, for joining me today, and uh, hope, hopefully we can uh, do this again sometime soon. You know, I just tell you one thing, you know, I wish, you know. Course, uh, one time, you know, I was the Minister of Tourism of Venezuela and Governor of Caracas. Uh, I spend my time talking, you know, about my country, how proud we are of our people, our system, with all its weaknesses and defects. And for me, to have to talk uh, in this media, in this way, about my own country, about so many of our people, and to talk to the legacy of a man who could be dying or maybe is dead in Havana, is uh, leaving behind hate, confrontation, violence, is really a terrible legacy for Venezuela, which will be very difficult to get rid of uh, or to surmount it. And uh, that's the challenge that uh, Venezuela we will have in the future. Thank you, Josh, so much for having me. All right, well, I hope we can talk about more promising things uh, soon. So. Thank you. All right, All right thanks, thanks so much. much. All right.